And what this means is that this morning you have the opportunity to hear from Tom Welch of Linspire just a little sooner. We're pleased to have Tom Welch here, um, Chief Information Officer for Linspire Incorporated, uh, a company that's done uh, perhaps more than any others in the desktop Linux space to get desktop Linux to my mother and to the average end user through channel partnerships and making sure that be it a Best Buy or a Fry's or a CompUSA, you actually have the opportunity to purchase, as well as relationships with Walmart and the reselling of outstanding hardware with their Linux desktop. And so this morning, we're going to have the chance to hear from Tom and hear what Linspire has been up to. And uh, I'm real pleased to have him here with us. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Um, first of all, who here has heard from uh, Linspire? Okay, pretty much everybody. Well, uh, Scott did a great job of kind of introducing what we're all about and who we are. But I'm going to give you a little bit more of a of an in-depth preview of what Linspire is about. What I want to do is I want to make this really interactive. We've got a very small group, so let's you have questions. Ask, raise your hand, ask them. I'll answer the best I can. Uh, and, and then let's just make this really, really interactive. But what I wanted to do is kind of give you an overview of uh, Linspire, what it's about, and talk about our CNR advantage or the click and run advantage, and then uh, talk about a use case and then answer any questions you have. I first have to say that, you know, we, Linspire kind of had a bad rap, especially early on. Um, we, uh, you know, we kind of were, were criticized by a lot of people in the Linux community. That's changed quite a bit after people have seen some of the things that we've done. But early on, we did get a kind of a bad rap because we were doing things that were not very traditional in the Linux space. So um, if you have questions, just let me know. So first of all, we, we focus exclusively on the desktop. We don't do a server platform. Um, we, we have no intentions of doing a server platform. We've... Uh, we partner with other companies that do have server products when we have to go into deals like that, such as Red Hat and even Novell. Um, but we are only exclusively focused on the desktop. As you can see, this is an example, or this is a screenshot of our desktop. It's very easy to, to use, very friendly. We put a, a tremendous amount of, of thought into what the average computer user, and I'm not saying the average Linux computer user, we're talking about the average computer user would expect or wants to see on their desktop. So the average computer user doesn't know what root is. They don't know what sudo is. They don't, they don't know any of the technical stuff at all. They don't even want to see a command line. Uh, you have to remember, uh, pretty much everybody that's been using Windows recently has never even seen a command line. Back in the old days with Windows 3.0 and 3.1, you booted up to DOS and then you started Windows. Well, it's, you know, people don't even remember those days. They don't want to see a command line. They don't want to have anything to do with that. So we put a lot of thought into how it looks and feels to a person who is a non-computer literate type of person. Uh, we put consumer first, and then we, f we find that small business and enterprises come on after. Um, so we don't target directly to the enterprise or the small business even. We, f we target directly to the consumers, and then that pulls us into these other opportunities. As people use the product and they find the products useful, we find this strategy works really well for a company that's not big like Novell or like uh, Red Hat, we find that the strategy works really well because we can advertise and market to the consumer fairly easily. Every time a new computer that, first let me back up a little bit. We, we sell Inspire through a series of OEMs. Uh, we sell very little bit of our software off our website, uh, direct. Uh, we sell most of our software from builders all around the world uh, that, that pre-install Inspire on a computer. And then that, that machine is sold in through the retail channel. This is very similar to how Microsoft makes most of their money with Windows, obviously. So we do sell it off our website, but we don't focus on that as much as we do off our builder channel. Every time a machine in the world that is running Linspire uh, starts up and connects to the Internet for the very first time, it phones home. And so this map here shows us in one month all of the different locations where Linspire was... Uh, a Linspire machine, brand new Linspire machine lit up. Uh, and you can see from the legend, the bigger the dots, the more people that were in that particular area. So you can see we've got a pretty good geographic spread across the world. Obviously, USA and, and, um, and Europe are our hot areas, but we are seeing a lot of growth in South America, Central America, Australia as well. 
This map here actually shows every time somebody turns on their Linspire machine every day and, and connects to the internet. This machine, we register that. Um, and so this shows you in the same time period the number of people were, it's, the geographic areas are very similar, but the number of people using Linspire in one month period. So we use this information to track all kinds of information and provide useful utilities and services for our customers. In where? Alice. I don't know where Alice Springs is. Where's it? Ah, you know, I don't know. Don't know. Somebody's obviously using it, or they've got an IP that's mapped to that location, so I don't know. Somebody else had a question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, it's controlled through our CNR software. So if the consumer doesn't want to have that happen, he certainly can turn. This is an example. This is down in, in Central America. This is a, uh, a computer retail establishment called Electra, and those are all Linspire boxes being shipped to their stores nationwide. So again, it just kind of reiterates the point that we don't sell directly off our website as much as we sell through a, a, a partner channel. The reason, obviously, is that if somebody's walking in, we're a consumer brand, somebody's walking into a computer store, for a, a buy, a, a Best Buy, Fry's, CompUSA, or whatever, and they see a computer, that's what they're going to buy. They're not necessarily buying an operating system. So uh, that's why we've really targeted this particular route. Uh, we believe that the ease of use is vital for mass adoption of Linux on the desktop. I mean, we've all said that, and a lot of distributions are kind of going after this ease of use uh, a mantra, but we really focus a ton of time in everything that we do to try to make sure that, that it is extremely easy to use. We do things that that a lot of people probably don't even think about. For example, we were one of the first uh, Linux distributions to consolidate the menu structure so that when you, when you look at the Linspire menu, you have nice categorized things. So that means that every single package that you can install with Linspire through our CNR warehouse has to fit within one of those categories. We don't want things creating their own categories in your menu. If you look at the Windows menuing system, it's a mess. You got you know, nothing's categorized. You get a Windows list that's huge. Trying to find new applications is a nightmare because they're not sorted alphabetically or by any category. We've, we've done a lot of work even to that level of detail to try to make it so that the first time use is really extremely easy, which is why we call ourselves the easiest desktop Linux. But one of the things that we spent a lot of time on was these what we call flash tutorials. We have audio and video flash tutorials. They, they automatically launch the first time you use Linspire, and you can also launch them anytime you want later from a menu. And basically, they talk about everything. In fact, if you look on the, on the right-hand side, those are all the different categories that they walk you through. So, you know, even things like how to set up your wireless networking, how to, uh, you know, browse the web, how to set up your email. And so we walk the user through with an audio and video tutorial of what they need to do. We find that this, is, this helps people get over a lot of the learning curve if they're new to to, uh, to computing or if you're even new to, uh, to Linux itself. We actually did a study based on some criteria that we came up with, uh, that some independent people came up with. We actually did a study of some of the other distributions. I'm not showing this slide to try to knock other distributions per se, but showing it that our focus really is the consumer, not necessarily the Linux crowd. Because some of the other distributions up there have some really cool stuff that we don't have. But what we did is we really took things, for example, uh, file types. We wanted to make sure that out of the box, when you get a Linux, install Linspire, uh, everything works from Flash, from AVIs, MP3s, AUGs. I mean, we have a whole list of file types that we rigorously test every time we install or every time we put a new version out to make sure that out of the box, all those things work seamlessly. That was an example of a criteria. So we, so a lot of these testing criteria came up, and of course we scored very high on that rating just because we've spent so much time, and we carry that through. It really is, you know, the the, the slogan in our office is it's got to be easy enough for your grandma to use. So we really try to focus in that area. I talked a little bit about file compatibility. We don't believe that it, it's application compatibility. For those, uh, for those of you who remember when we started, we used to be called Lindos, and. Um, we at first really spent a lot of time in trying to create the wine technology, if you guys know what that is, make wine run Windows applications on Linux. 
And we spent close to over a half a million dollars in that initiative, donated all the code back, which is why um, uh, the crossover office is as good as it is today. But the reality is we realized that that really wasn't saving the consumer any money because he still had to go buy all these applications if he wanted to use the products. And it really wasn't getting us to where we wanted to be. It still had problems and bugs, and it was you know, always chasing something that was never going to be there. So we spent a lot of time and effort in file compatibility, and we've done this in several ways. We've, we've worked with companies to create as, as close to 100% compatibility in the standard formats as possible, and we've actually licensed the technology to support those types that, uh, that there wasn't you know, good Linux alternatives for at the time. So if you, right here, perfect, perfect lead-in, thank you. So if you actually go to our, look at the very bottom, if you look at linspire.com slash file types, if you go to that website there, you should be able to play every single one of those file types just by simply clicking on it and it should do the right thing. And this is an example of all the different media types. Uh, Office, obviously, we, we support, but audio, uh, MP3, AUG, WAVE, M MX, or Microsoft's audio format, Microsoft's video format, we actually license their technology. And um, QuickTime, Flash. So anyway, we spent a ton of time. When a user's browsing the web and they go to CNN and they want to watch a video, they don't want to be told they can't do it. This is a bad ex experience. And so we spent a ton of time making sure that doesn't happen. We also felt that there was some big holes in Linux, um, and so we've spent a lot of time either pioneering or assisting in the development of some fairly significant applications that run on Linux that, that bring us to a closer parity than for Windows. So for example, uh, we pioneered L Songs, which is a iTunes type program. It has a, mu a music store with thousands, tens of thousands of songs in it. Uh, L Photo is an iPhoto type application. NView which is a web authoring system so very similar to front page. Uh, L Assist, which is kind of, we, we, we've coined a term called follow me technology, but it's kind of your personal information that follows you around from place to place. And of course, OpenOffice and Firefox are ones that we've contributed to as well. Uh, of the first, of that six lists, I mean, we've contributed to 30, many other uh, applications as well, but those are kind of ones that we've really spent a lot of time and effort on. The first four we fund solely. They're open source, other people can contribute, but we fund them and manage them through our office. So uh, we believe in, in trying to fill some of the big holes that are out available in Linux today. And by doing this, we, we obviously want to be able to make it, the consumers switch from a Windows platform as seamless as possible. In fact, L Songs reads and writes iPods seamlessly. Uh, you know, it's very compatible with iTunes. We want to take a look at our whole product view. Those are all the different products that come pre-installed with Linspire. But we do something a little different here. If you look at a lot of Linux distributions, again, this is coming back to that simple to use thing. A lot of the Linux distributions provide you more than one alternative for some of the popular applications. For example, they may provide um, you know, two or three different instant messenger clients. They may install you know, OpenOffice and KWord or something like that. And so what we've done is we've We've tried to isolate that and say, okay, let's take the best of the breed out there and put that on our distribution. Because again, a person who is my grandma doesn't want to wonder which word processor she's going to use. She just knows, here's my word processor, and I use it. So uh, we, on the distribution, when you install it, we purposely limit the number of choices that the user has. In fact, we don't even give you a choice of the desktop. You get KDE. Again, because my grandma wouldn't know what KDE is. She doesn't know what GNOME is. She's just going to say, oh, this is what it looks like. So we do that, and it allows us to focus our energies and our efforts on that particular platform. But we do have um, quite a bit on the, the, dif the distribution by default. And so this is where we obviously can compete very handily with Microsoft by, by offering an office suite and offering, uh, you know, media players and all that kind of stuff on a distribution for a lot less money than Microsoft does in an OEM channel. Questions? Uh, drivers are a tricky question because um, here's the typical conversation. 
we need to have some driver support for your new XYZ card. Okay, well, how many units are you going to move? You know, well, we just sell the operating system. Well, you know, when you get 100,000 unit order, we'll talk to you about it. It's kind of the discussion. So what happens is uh, we don't ever talk to them directly initially. It's usually a builder that brings us the driver, the, the, the opportunity. For example, we were having a whole or horrible time with the gear modems. Uh, gear modems are fairly big, especially in, in Europe. You're a gear and a soft, a soft modem, not very good winds, uh, or Linux support. Medion, which is a tier one distributor over there, is shipping Linspire, and they went to a gear and says, we're not going to ship any more of your modems unless you get Linux drivers. Well, the next thing we get is a call that says, hey, we've got to work with you to get Linux drivers. So that's why we usually try to work with the builders who are shipping large quantities or who would like to ship large quantities. We're able to do that on some uh, situations. And then obviously we give those drivers, if we're able to, back to the open source community. Sometimes, uh, you know, they, their drivers are proprietary and, you know, they make you sign license agreements and other people can get them as well, but they, we're not able to redistribute them now. For example, Raylink drivers. Questions? All right. Um, we obviously use and support open source. We're a big supporter. These are all the different, some of the different packages that we've contributed to financially, as well as helped on the development on. Um, we've spent over a million dollars in, and we're not a big company. Uh, we're pretty small. We're about 70 employees. <clears throat> but we've spent over a million dollars in open source development and contributed that money and those improvements and so forth back to the community. Because obviously, it's, you know, we're not big enough to change the momentum against Microsoft. It's going to be a whole community effort. And, uh, and so the more people we can get on board with this, obviously, the more support we're going to have and the sooner we'll be able to offer some viable alternatives for even more people. We also include third-party licenses. Uh, unlike Ubuntu, which is a very good distribution, Ubuntu is all about free. They don't want to have anything that's non-free. We are, uh, you know, again, being a consumer-focused, we realize that, hey, I can't send somebody to CNN.com and tell them, oh, sorry, you can't look at any video. So, uh, so we actually go out, work with these, with different companies and secure licensing rights to their, their uh, technology so that people have a... A uh, very fluid consumer experience. A lot of these are easy to do. You know, ATI, NVIDIA have uh, have very uh, easy licenses to work with. Microsoft obviously was much more difficult, and uh, we actually had to port code uh, they provided and put it in our distribution. We have a worldwide distribution channel of OEMs, uh, not just in the United States or in North America, but truly is worldwide. South Africa. And India, so we're, we're starting to grow worldwide, and we're starting to. Uh, here's some of the U.S. brands you may be aware of. Some of the companies. These are OEMs that sell computers, or or they sell computers to retailers that would then sell our stuff. And then here's some of the uh, retail places where you can buy Linspire today. This is just smattering. We have 350, 400 retail partnerships as well. You know, again, not all of them are. Uh, Right on the front, Microsoft has a pretty strong hold. Um, in fact, we tell people, if you want a really good deal with Microsoft, if you want to get a better deal, this is what we tell our builders. If you want a better deal with your OEM pricing with Microsoft, start shipping Linspire. <laughs> because it's really true, Microsoft will then come in and, and try to, especially if they, they move any volume, will try to lock us out by giving them a pretty good deal. So uh, it's, a, it's an uphill road, uphill battle all the way, but yet we're making some pretty significant. Uh, progress. We obviously work with hardware vendors for better driver support. We talked a little bit about that, but you know, driver support was um, one of the top things that was talked about at the, at the recent uh, OSDL meeting that I attended up in Portland, Oregon. We were a lot of the open source groups got together and discussed what was really prohibiting mass adoption of Linux on the desktop, and <clears throat> we talked about um, we talked about three major issues that we decided to focus on, and one of them was hardware support. And that's just a constant battle. You've got, you know, the hardware is moving so fast, and especially coming out of Taiwan, a lot of these Taiwanese hardware manufacturers are not really concerned at all with Linux. And so they ship Windows stuff. They don't even know what Linux is a lot of times. And so 
it's a, it's a real battle, but, but through the OSDL, you're going to see some movement over the next year, a concerted effort by the whole industry to try to, to bring the hardware guys on board. It's also why we were a founding member of the DCC, uh, which is a Debian, uh, an alliance of Debian-based distributions that allows us to go to these hardware manufacturers and say, certify against the DCC's common core of, of packages, and that way you don't have to, you know, the problem with, with say, Intel and AMD and so forth is they, if they're going to support Linux, do they support brands or do they support platform, you know, different, distri uh, different code bases? And so we tried to make that simple by saying, if you want to support Debian, you know, certify to the DCC, and then you'll support all of us that are members of the DCC. So Alex, who was supposed to be here this morning, he's, they're a founding member as well, the DCC. Whenever we get a piece of hardware in, we send it through a fairly rigorous hardware certification process um, where we are able to um, work very closely with the hardware vendor to make sure that, uh, that, the pro that the product certifies, or if it doesn't, we can communicate with them and work with them on possible solutions. So um, it takes probably a third of my engineering resources to work through the hardware certification, but at the same sense, it's well worth it because we able to deploy on so many more machines. Sometimes we get hit a little bit by saying, well, you don't support some XYZ weird platform. But we really try to focus on the target market for us, which is typically the lower end computers, um, mass produced by System Max and some of these uh, Taiwanese brands. Somebody's spending, for example, on a laptop, when somebody's spending $1,500 to $2,000 to $2, on a laptop, they're less concerned about spending an extra 100 bucks on Windows. If somebody's spending $700 on a laptop, that's a lot more compelling for them to want to have a cheap operating system as well. So that's where we see kind of our, our niche right now. Pictures of our hardware certification lab. Um, again, we have a lot of PCs. They're all sent from our partners around the world. We do a lot of laptops too. Uh, we spend a tremendous amount of time with power management, which if anybody in the Linux world knows, it's, it's a pain. Um, not quite 100% there yet, but there are, you know, we try to make them work with the laptops that we endorse through our distributors. So if somebody sends us, ECS sends us a laptop, we try to make sure that hibernation works well, that, that everything kind of works right out of the box. So the person brings it home, he doesn't have to fiddle with anything. And also, uh, if you look, this is kind of showing a little menu item, but uh, uh, we have a diagnostics report that any user can can activate, and if you run that, what that basically does is it walks through a little wizard, collects a ton of information about your machine, and, and it collects what's working and what's not working, and then it sends it on to us, and it gets inserted into a database so that we can start building a very robust list of what devices work and which devices don't. What's interesting about this, though, is, is as long as you have network connectivity and, and a GUI, if everything else is not working, this will collect the information, so PCI cards, uh, smart media devices, USB devices, this collects it all, sends it on to us, and then we can, we can start putting patterns together. We can say, okay, how many people have this particular device? And that's how we can then prioritize on what's the most important to work on. Interrupt me if you have questions. Absolutely. Through uh, our next thing I was talk going to talk about, which is called CNR. We absolutely do. Um, CNR stands for click and run, but CNR is more than just, what CNR is, it's a delivery mechanism, but it's also a communication facility between uh, that person's computer and, and our servers. And so with CNR, they can install new software, but they can also be notified of updates and install those updates. Uh, driver updates, kernel updates, program updates, doesn't matter. So if I have a digital camera that's not working, and then we find a newer version of some library that supports that digital camera, we can make that available through CNR, and people who want to have that can get that. There's both automatic updates. So in other words, everything that you have on your computer, it'll say, here's what you have on your computer, and here's what's newer. Or you can obviously search for new stuff just that you don't have, you've never installed. We, follow, we find that uh, we call Linspire, many times we call it a, a broadband OS. Uh, and our market really is for people who are connected, um, high-speed connected, because 
all of the content we deliver is typically big. Uh, installing new programs, we do support modems, and some people do use modems with Linspire, but the reality is most people uh, you know, using Linspire need to have a high-speed connection to get the full advantage of what we provide. So it's kind of funny because we're actually seeing a lot of growth in the emerging markets area. Uh, Mexico, South America, we're seeing huge growth. But um, the reason is is because even though that they're emerging markets and maybe don't have the prosperity that we have, they are jumping straight to broadband. They don't have to go through that same you know, 1,200 baud modem experience that we had to go back, back in the 80s. They, you know, their, their, phone system, their phone companies and so forth are immediately putting in broadband cable or, or DSL or, or whatever. And so these are people that are getting computers for the first time and having access to broadband and having access to the Internet. In fact, it's really interesting because um, what's happening in some of the countries is the phone company or, uh, are, as part of your phone bill, they'll include a, uh, a computer. So in other words, you're leasing a computer and you're leasing and you get the internet connection and you get your phone. And everybody's getting a phone in, for example, Mexico, so they can also have a computer. There's other things we've seen where uh, builders are putting computers in homes. And so if you go buy this home from a builder, you get a computer and you get brought so they do some very interesting things to help people finance the computers, and that's why I would say we're seeing some very interesting growth, in, in especially in, in Latin America. In uh, India, for example, they don't have phone lines run to a lot of the villages. What they do is they have wireless. So, uh, so for example, you would, ha you would have a, your home in a small village. You wouldn't have a phone run line run that runs directly to your home, but they will... Uh, lease you these little wireless things and then talk to a phone line that's maybe, you know, half a mile away. And so it's using a wireless infrastructure so they don't have to build out all the cabling and so forth. It's interesting to see how, how they're getting around the problems that, that uh, we really didn't have issues with. We, we kind of evolved with the modems and the phone lines to everybody's house to, to you know, DSL or to cable. Uh, so CNR allows us to, to basically install and distribute a whole series of products and services to our customer base. CNR isn't just about installing software products, but we also have other products as well. For example, um, we have a product called SurfSafe, which is a, an internet filtering software. Because we control the operating system, we can actually, we actually modify it at the kernel level, and so people can't really easily hack it. Kids can't hack it. So it's a very secure way of, of locking down your internet connection and not allowing people to go to objectionable sites. Uh, interesting story about VirusSafe. When we first started, we got our first version out and then we started asking our users, what is, what is it you want? What are we missing? And the number one response was we need virus protection, which we thought was kind of funny because it really wasn't really a lot of Linux viruses. I mean, I don't know of anybody that's ever been attacked by a Linux virus running Linux. So we, we were saying, well, you know, we thought about how can we educate people that they don't need this? This is one of those things where they can save money by not having to buy that. And we found that it was an uphill battle. People said they, they wanted to have virus protection, so we finally gave it to them. So what we did is we went out and found a, a good Linux virus scanning software where we had to write a GUI around it because specifically at the time, there wasn't a good Linux GUI a virus solution. So we wrote one, we, uh, and we call it VirusSafe. And it works well. If you have a virus, it'll find it. But the reality is it's our number one selling product because, our, again, our market is people who are saying, I'm from this Windows world, and I know I am never supposed to have a computer unless it has virus protection on it. And so that's just one of those things that they're in their mind. They have a checkoff list. I've got to be able to word processing. I've got to be able to you know, browse the, the Internet, and I've got to have virus protection. And it, it, came, it became an uphill battle for us to try to tell people they didn't need it. Yes, that's true, but, but what happens with a lot of those email viruses is that when you read them, they have some script in them or whatever that then runs and it goes to, throughout your email address book and propagates. But that doesn't happen on Linux. So the only way is I would get some strange email from you and I would consciously say, I'm going to forward this to a friend, which even that is unlikely. So 
but it, yeah, it will catch it. So, you know, I guess for those rare occasions when that does happen, um, we do have virus protection. Like I say, number one selling product outside of our CNR, soft, uh, CNR service. It's the number one selling product. It blew our minds, but, well, you know, what are we to argue with what the consumer wants? We also have other products and services that we add, though. And again, they're all del delivered through the CNR service. This is that, it's, it's like a highway that comes from their computer to our computer. And it actually enables us to do some very amazing things. I'll talk about it more in a bit in our case study. Localization for international and emerging markets. <coughs> Excuse me. We, um, we, we created a, 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 um, a technology about a year ago, we, we started getting ready to release it called IRMA. IRMA is a website that anybody in the world can go to and sign up for and help us translate Linspire into their operating, into their language. So, for example, I can go in here, sign up for free, and I say, okay, I know how to speak German and English. And so it'll say, okay, you're going to help translate German. Here's ten phrases. Please translate these for, the, for me. And they... They translate them. Now, we obviously don't have money to pay everybody this, but we do compromise, you know, give them access to source code and so forth. But what's happened is this is a testament to the open source world. We have literally thousands of translators translating 15, 20, 30 different languages at any one time. And our commitment to the community is as soon as we get a language about 80% translated, we'll, we'll polish it off and fin finish off the build. What that means is we have to do things like the, the tutorials, the audio video tutorials, and and uh, things that you really can't put in an IRMA database. But um, through this whole IRMA process, we've been able to produce uh, uh, seven or eight languages that are very complete in their translations. Uh, Japanese, German, French, Spanish, two, two flavors of Spanish, uh, Italian, Dutch. I, I'm missing some, but I mean, we've got quite a few. And it's because of Irma. We don't have to do most of that translating. We just basically open up Irma. I invite you to go and check it out if you want. But basically, people can go in there and they can say, I want to translate for this language. And it gives them uh, you know, phrases and they translate them. And then we, we have moderators that verify the translations are correct. People said, well, man, what's stopping somebody from going in there and doing wrong translations? And the reality is the moderators can check that. But the reality is these people, it's not in their best interest to do that. They really don't. It's like the open source world. People say, well, what if people put buggy code in there? We all know they don't. And same with Irma. They don't put bad translations in. They may get it a little bit incorrect or whatever that a moderator will maybe fix up. But they typically don't put bad stuff in there. So it's proven to be very successful for us, and we'll see a huge expansion of this program within Linspire. Uh, our goal for 2006 with Irma is to open source the whole project so that uh, anybody can put any package in there and, and have it translated properly. So basically, you take free open source Linux and you add all the components that I've talked about, which basically gives you what Linspire is today. Again, it's a lot of work and effort that we do, but we feel it's very important for the consumer to be able to have that use of use experience. The click and run. I want to talk about the click and run a little bit more. We talked a little bit about what it is. It's basically a, a highway between the, the user's computer and, uh, and our servers. And basically, when you open up click and run, this is basically what you get. Basically, it shows you you can um, get software, you can get services. We do a lot more than that. We actually can monitor that if the user wants us to, we can actually monitor the health of their computer. We can actually uh, install software remotely if we want. This is used in, uh, in businesses, for example, uh, where I'm in charge of maintaining these 40 computers. I can actually, from a web browser, say, OK, I want to install these three programs and take off these two programs on these, this block of 40 computers. And we can do it all remotely. Let's do this whole CNR process. Uh, people say, well, what's the difference between click and run and, say, apt get? You're familiar with the Debian world. Apt is what, how you install packages. And, and at first, <clears throat> we were based really on top of apt. Basically, we just put a very thin layer on top of apt. Our early tests showed that apt if you just do an app get space open office, app get open office, you'd get about 65 to 70 percent of the time it would succeed. The rest of the time it would fail. You'd have either dependency problems, you'd have connection problems. I mean, a variety of things. That was our test showed about 65 to 70 percent of the time it would fail, and that was 
True enough, that was our success and failure rate too because, again, we laid right on top of apt. But we, um, we spent three years working on our technology, and we are now at 95% success ratio on every time somebody decides to click and run an application. 95% of the time it will, it will succeed. The rest of the time is weird, strange things that happen that cause, you know, I mean, it could be a dependency problem, it can be uh, a connection problem. But we've gone a long way to try to smooth those problems out. For example, if enough people try to click and run some application and it fails a certain amount of times, it automatically takes it out of our warehouse so that people can't try to get it anymore until we get it fixed. So that's how we get a better success ratio is we're flagged about products that are project, uh, packages that are bad. And then also we do things like retrying if, they, if the download breaks or whatever. So uh, we've gotten our success ratio up very high. But the other thing we do besides just being a very thin layer on top of app is we go through all the packages in what we call our warehouse and we categorize them and we sort them based on what we call charts. So this is a popularity chart. This is a chart of all packages. So you can see the number one package that's click and run is our LSONGS package. Um, Adobe Acrobat Reader is number two and Firefox. And this changes on a weekly basis. Maybe it's even daily. I don't know how often they run the ranks. But, but I mean it changes very often. If, if uh, some new package comes out, that may jump to the top as being the most highly click and run package. But <clears throat> if you look, each of the categories up here, you can click on them, and if you were to click on them, it would show you the, the categories, it would show you the rankings within those categories. So if I were to go to business and finance, Acrobat Reader would probably be number one. Um, or actually, that's multimedia and design, so whatever the, you know, maybe open office or something like that. But the idea is that this allows the user very easy to see what's the, what's the most important applications. By simply clicking the little green running man, they can install the software. It'll download it, install it, configure it, ready to go. If they want to see more information, they simply click on the, the, the link there or the little eye, and it will show them all kinds of information. So that's where this whole tab here, this, the CNR warehouse, we call it a warehouse because it's like a big warehouse, a, pl a price club warehouse, where you can go and browse around from any kind of application you want. So again, a lot more detail than you would get from apt. Aisles, I'll talk about that in a minute. Aisles are kind of a unique thing that we created, but are kind of cool, especially for companies that have to administer banks of computers. Um, so click and Run also allows you to manage your services, so you can either purchase or turn on and off services here, such as VirusSafe, I can turn it on or off, SurfSafe. So simply, you know, it's kind of an area where you can say, okay, I want to turn on SurfSafe, my kids are going to use the computer for a while. And then obviously we show... Um, uh, all the products that you have click and run and we show which ones are available for updates. So this was my computer a while back. I, I went to my available updates and you can see here's all the packages that are, there are new versions for. I can get them all with one click or I can, I can selectively say oh, I want to get the new open office. Click and it'll download that one. Install it and configure it. Now the interesting thing about what we do that apt doesn't do <clears throat> Is, um, is regard to the internationalization. If you, uh, if you install certain packages that are internationalized, you actually have to install two components. You have to install the base package and then the language package. <clears throat> and usually what happens is the base package includes an English version, and then the language package you know, will overlay the English version. So what happens is, is we have to be smart enough to say, oh, if they click and run OpenOffice, and they're running a German version, we've got to make sure we also pull in the OpenOffice German pack. But we don't want to do that if they're running Spanish. We want to get the Spanish one. So we do all that for the consumer. They don't ever see that. That's all invisible. It's something that we do that, again, app doesn't do. The history will show you everything you've clicked and run and allows you to uninstall it from here as well. So if you say, oh, I no longer want Sentry Solitaire, I can uninstall it. Here's a, here's a product page. So remember I showed you if you want to click and find out more information about a product, you click on that. And here you can see it'll show you screenshots. It'll show you more information about it. There's links to the source code if it's an open source package so that you can download the source code right there. And uh, find out all, everything you want to know about it. Again, a very consumer-friendly focus on this. It's, it's kind of fun. In fact, my kids, their funnest thing to do is go, you know, digging through clicker on finding what programs they can find that are kind of cool. And they found some pretty good ones that even I didn't even know about. Some of them are dumb and some of them are good. We show user reviews. Uh, so again, 
I like the package, I can go in and I can say, hey, this is a great package, write my comments, or I can say, hated the package, it didn't work for me, whatever the user wants. This is kind of a summary of the of, of all that, that Click and Run does. Um, you know, again, if you look at what apt, get, apt does, apt get, it does like the first three or four items, but we kind of add all the other things to it. Things like, uh, we actually even have a technology called CNR Sign. One of the things we can do with Click and Run is we can actually deliver proprietary software as well, not just open source software, and we do do that. So for example, Star Office you can get through Click and Run, and um, uh, there's a fee for that obviously, um, but uh, it allows them to just to dist deliver it through the Click and Run process instead of saying, okay, stick the CD in, now go run this, and, and you all know the, the routine. So we've developed a technology called CNR Sign that allows the vendor uh, a high degree of confidence that the CNR, uh, that when somebody CNRs it, they are the owner of it, they have actually purchased it, that they can't copy the binaries and so forth. So CNR is a technology we created. We um, talk about the IELTS for a minute. We created a technology called IELTS. So the idea is that I can go find all the programs that I typically want on, on a particular machine. I can create an aisle. And let's, let's use it in the business sense. I can say, okay, I have this, um, this, let's say, administrative assistance computer. I have 30 administrative assistants that I work with. I can set up an aisle for them, and this is the packages that they have on there. They have open office. They have web browser, they have X, Y, and Z. I can put all those in an aisle. Anytime I put a new machine up and I need to put that on that administrative assistance with one click, it'll install all those packages on the aisle for me. So aisles are just like shortcuts to install a bunch of packages. It's really handy, especially in the school districts when we set up the state of Indiana, is you know they create aisles uh, and say, okay, you know, here's the geometry class, here's what they need. Or here's the teachers, here's what they need. Um, there's two ways to handle that. Generic consumer product, it assumes that you are the owner of the computer and so whatever you want to do. Now, within Click and Run itself, you can say, I want to require a password every time I use Click and Run, that way my kid can't come in and do, start buying things with, with CMD. Um, in an enterprise, we typically lock that down so that the administrator remotely can administer the machine, but the user can't. Does that answer your question? Done. But again, most of our cells come through OEM pre-installed on the computer. We find that we put it in the, um, in the retail shelves strictly from an educational purpose, an awareness purpose. You know, people say, well, I want to see it on Fry's shelf, but we don't sell a lot of them on, in that mode. Because most, especially our target market, they wouldn't know how to install an operating system. Now, installing Linspire is extremely easy. You just basically stick the CD in, there's like five questions, and it's done. But still, my wife would never go buy an operating system and install it. You know, if it doesn't come on the computer, she's not doing it. And so that's really where our, our focus is. Um, they can, if there's a Linux-based product, they can install the Linux software just like anybody else would. So if I find some Linux software and it's not in our Click and Run warehouse, I certainly can install just because it is a Linux distribution. <clears throat> but most of our customers prefer to install through CNR if it's available. So what we do is we, when we find those applications, we go out and work with the vendors and try to get them to package their package their product in our CNR warehouse. We call those CNBs, click and buys. And typically what happens is I'd, I'd find it, I click on it and says, hey, this product's $19.95. You want to buy it? Yes. You know, enter your payment information. And then it downloads it, installs it, configures it. And then I can download it as many times as I need on my computer, if for some reason I reinstall this software or change computers, I can re-download it without having to go through that process. If it's not in our warehouse, if it's not in our warehouse, it's not managed. So. We work really hard to make sure that as much open source out there is in our warehouse. 
I have a whole team called the services team. And services because they are working on products for member services. And their whole job is to go out and make sure that the warehouse is up to date with pra packaging programs. We find them. People throughout the whole company know they can send an email to the services team. Here's a new package I sent. We need to get it in the warehouse. They'll go out and bundle it up, put it in the warehouse, make it. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, Ubuntu, Debian are the two big ones that you can use. Uh, but w CNR, again, it does a lot of stuff. It, it really adds a lot to the user's experience. We charge for CNR. This is how we make our money. We charge money for the OEMs, and then we also charge the consumer for CNR. So people say, well, what? You're charging for open source. This was one of the, critic the complaints we got early on. And the answer is we're not charging for open source. We are charging for a service to deliver the open source to your computer. Think of it as a haircut. Every one of you guys can go and cut your own hair. You can take the clippers out and cut it. Most of us don't cut our own hair. Most of us go to a barber, and the barber cuts our hair. Why? Because they'll do a better job of it. Well, it's the same thing with, with CNR. You can install it. You can go and find all the software you want, install it the old traditional Linux way, but if you want the service and the convenience and the and all the helpful stuff, then you pay us a $20 a year fee. I'll give you a use case. State of Indiana, Department of Education. Um, the State of Indiana came out and said, okay, we're going to create a, we're going to have an initiative where we're going to provide as many computers in the classroom as possible so we can have a one-to-one -one computer experience with students. <clears throat> they uh, selected two vendors, Hardware and two software vendors. So hardware was, uh, and they had a mandate where the, the companies had to be, have ownership within the state of, of Indiana. So one vendor was a company called uh, Wintergreen Systems, and the other one was Dell. Uh, Dell actually bought a company in Indiana so they could play with, the, they could work within this bid. But um, so those were two hardware vendors, and then it was Novell and, and ourselves. And the idea is that they could go out and they could, and the school districts could decide which platform they wanted to install, and then they would install. We um, went and visited the schools after they set it up, and this is what they did that was kind of unique. They built these specialized desks. They did them in quantity, so they got a pretty good deal on them. So you can see the glass tops. The keyboards, the monitors were down below the glass tops, and, uh, and the computers were down in a rack. You can see the students can use a desk as a regular desk whenever they're not using the computer. And all they have to do is move the books aside, and they can see the screen and do whatever they need to do with the computer. Uh, the computers were all networked into a one central network statewide. So although the schools had their local networks, the school districts had their local networks, the state also runs one master network. And in fact, all the school traffic goes through the state's network. So the state was able to very easily, for example, provide filtering, internet filtering, proxying, all that kind of stuff from the state level. Here's an example of the Dell machine running Linspire through the desk. The biggest challenge they had after they started deploying some of these was glare. So they actually went through and, and ordered different glass to put in the, the things so that didn't reflect so bad the, the fluorescent lights that were above the, the students. <clears throat> but they've had a very high success ratio with this because what happens is, you know, a lot of them, you see the computer in front of the student and he's doing this. Teacher can't see the student, student can't see the teacher, can't see the blackboard. The desk was a very key part of their design and success. But also was selecting and limiting the number of vendors that they allowed so that the school districts felt supported. They felt like that they could um, be there, you know, have somebody to help them with the problems that they had. Every school district was left to their own devices to, to implement it. So some school districts, the, the system administrator ran around with a CD with to each workstation and installed it that way. Uh, other ones, they used a pseudo thin client type approach, but there was various, you know, they had different things there. Obviously, their biggest challenge was that they had some Windows software, specifically software that came from the, the book uh, content providers. So like these content providers, you know, you'd buy a bunch of textbooks and they come with software. A lot of that software wouldn't work. It's Windows based. That was a challenge for them. Um, right now, it's mostly students that are using it. The teachers have not switched. Um, 
mostly because they don't have nearly the number of teachers and they already have current licenses for those. But I, our prediction is that they eventually will. Their prediction is that they will eventually have 300,000 workstations statewide. It comes in little batches, so they'll get a few million dollars, they'll go spend that, they'll get a few million more dollars from the state legislature, they'll spend that. But it worked out pretty well. Questions? That will inspire about uh, what we're Ah, uh, good question. Our intelligence shows that for the most part, a retailer or a builder, I should say, is paying between 60, 60 and $70 for windows. Um, they don't often ship office on the, on the machines anymore unless it's a higher end machine because the cost is too great. We typically OEM, Linspire, between 10 and $15. Now, most of the time, that cost is carried straight through with Linspire. So you're talking a $50 delta. Absolutely. I mean, they, they have to be worried about it because Here's the dilemma they're in. They can't go and say, okay, well, we just want to crush the competition, so we'll lower the price. Because right now, Linux has got such a small, minute share of the market that lowering the price to all of their customers would kill, would kill them. So they have to basically do one-off. They have to kind of take pot shots at, at the Linux folks. Uh, you know, and so they do this kinds of things. The reality is, everything they're doing is being, becoming more restrictive. In fact, you've probably read in the press how they're trying to lock their version of Windows or their version of Office into the BIOS. So there's absolutely no way you can transfer a license. They don't want you to transfer a license. They want you to buy a new license of the product when you go to a new version or you go to a new computer. So everything they're doing is being more restrictive versus everything we're trying to do is much more open. Any other questions? Microsoft. Apple, uh, Apple's you know done well. You know what? They're five six percent of the market share. They've they've grown a little bit, but not much. Um, but we don't see this competitor. We see there's one competitor, Microsoft. Ninety percent of the market share is Microsoft. You know they've got a lot. They've got a lot of problems that people are getting fed up with. As much shouting and screaming as we can do to educate people doesn't move the ball forward. What moves the ball forward is when Microsoft has all the problems. And that's what people get frustrated with. I mean, I can't tell you, I've been in the industry a lot of years, I can't tell you how many people call me up, can you come help me take this virus off my computer? You know, hey, how many IT companies now have full-time people that go around and keep keeping the desktops locked down? It's such a big problem. <clears throat> so, you know, Microsoft's the target, but people are becoming more and more disgruntled with what's happening with Microsoft and with what's happening with Longhorn and, and the costs. It's expensive. And so by uh, prov providing a very good alternative at a lot cheaper price, a lot of people are willing to make that jump. Are we 100% compatible with everything Microsoft does? Absolutely not. We've got you know, a long way to go still. It's kind of like the whole Southwest Delta kind of thing, you know, where Delta gives you a lot, used to anyway, give you a lot more amenities, but people were willing to fly Southwest because it was cheaper. And, and so some people are willing to take a little more of, a, of inconvenience but saving a whole lot of money, you know, with, for, uh, let's just take retail prices. If you took retail price of Linspire, which is like 40 bucks, and retail price of CNR, which is 20 bucks, 60 bucks, and you can get a lot of software that would cost you hundreds of dollars in the Windows world. So, you know, the economics, especially in the emerging markets, is huge. Microsoft, I don't know if you guys saw the announcement, but they were over in India, made a big announcement, Bill Gates, Big fanfare. We're going to license uh, the starter edition of Microsoft's Windows for $40 to India. The starter edition. Have you ever seen the starter edition? It doesn't do anything. Okay, a lockdown, you can't, you know, it's, it's, it's pathetic, but 40 bucks. And, you know, of course, it was Microsoft, and because they donate a lot of money to the school districts over there or the school organizations, 
they got a lot of fanfare. But the reality is, you know, we price our product in the emerging markets based on their economy. So although you may be able to get it over here for $15 OEM, in uh, Mexico it's more like four or five bucks. So, you know, you go to India, it's a few bucks a copy compared to $40 for a scaled down, limited, crippled version of Windows. So economics are definitely there. Very little. We, uh, we've worked really hard to keep our licensing prices down. So um, most of our licensing fees were flat fees, okay, where we paid one fee and then as many copies as we can distribute. There are some exceptions to that. And, uh, and so sometimes, like for example, the DVD player, we have per unit licensing there. So if somebody wants to include a DVD player in their distribution, when we, like a lot of times we'll one-off distributions for building. They want DVD player in there. We have to charge them a per unit. Um, the retail edition doesn't have a DVD player built in, but you can get it through Click and Run. So it's like fifteen dollars or ten dollars, something like that. Yeah, I know. We've met. See, some of this is misinformation. Hey, we're 65, 70 member company. We do not have the resources to go out to all these stores. But for example, Fry's, we did 50,000 units last quarter. So if they're saying that they don't want, that they don't have a Linux-based computer, it isn't true. Now, maybe that's, that particular salesperson is uninformed. Maybe, uh, maybe that CompUSA person is uninformed. But from a corporate perspective, they've picked up Linux. Let me give you an example of how we're working with some. We have to kind of hunt and peck and choose our best simply because we don't have the resources. But one of the, the companies that we do a lot of work with is Microtail. Microcenter, excuse me, Microcenter. And uh, they are actually developing a store within a store. And it will be a Linux-based section within their store, kind of like have you seen Apple and, uh, and uh, you know, used to be just computer sections, but now you have kind of Apple section and Windows section where they're actually going to have a Linux-based section where it will be highlighted. So, and we've helped them set up with some of the, with POP and, you know, all of the kind of stuff that they do from the marketing perspective to really promote that. But it is tough because the reality is you go into a retail store and you don't know anything about Linux. The salesperson doesn't know anything about, about Linux. So a guy comes in and says, well, hey, I'd like to see this machine. Can you tell me about it? First thing he a lot of times does is says, well, hey, I'm going to show you this other machine. Because that's where his comfort zone is. So we've created self-running demos that this basically can run, that they just have to start up and, and let it run to try to educate it. But it's a very, very tough problem.
<laughs> well, it is true. And in fact, uh, the machines we sell most in the fries is their low end, they call it their loss leader. They move a lot of the product. It's a $200 machine, has an Inspire on it, and they move a lot of them. And some people are just taking it and wiping it and putting you know, windows on it or whatever they want. We, we readily acknowledge that. But the reality is, it's a very, very challenging uh, thing to educate all these salespeople. Their comfort zone is Windows. And Microsoft has a lot of power in the retail establishment that we're fighting against. Thanks, John. I'll give you that 20 bucks later. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Uh, when when by default when you set up the networking, it defaults to a firewall that's you know opening up the most popular ports, and the user can then configure that. So the user has control over that. You know we got hit early on because people said, "Oh, you're installing as root," which by the way you don't have to run as root. We allow you to set up any number of users, but that was an early criticism. And, uh, you know, our, our former CEO, Michael Robertson, was our founder. And he's, uh, he founded mp3.com, for those of you who remember that venture. And, um, you know, he likes, to, he likes to make controversy. <laughs> and he's made some comments, Root is as safe as running you know, anything. And, it's, you know, he maybe he's a little off base and sometimes when he makes comments like that. But the reality is, I run as a user. Uh, we've really worked hard to make the user experience, if you want to run as a user and have that total protection, is, as, as, you know, is, is easy to work with as possible. But the reality is, what's the most important thing on your computer? Your data. Your data you have access to. And, you know, the average consumer, his, you know, his, uh, his box is usually behind a, some kind of a Belkin router or some kind of a router at his desk, uh, or I mean, you know, uh, at his home or so forth. And so we try to educate our users about the security risks. We make v patches available through our CNR warehouse whenever there's, they're available. And try to educate users to understand the differences between what Linspire and what Linux is and what they have with Windows. And like I say, with the virus protection, it's an uphill battle. <laughs> they don't want, they just don't think that's, you know, that's important. But, all right, anything else? Yeah. Um, it usually goes directly to us. We have not found that that's... On, on the Tier 1's builders, the Dells and the HP's, that is concern. And the reason is because, especially, for example, Dell. You buy your machines pretty much direct from Dell. And so they don't want to jump into any of these new Linux experiments without having everything lined up with support, with customer service people, everything. Um, a lot of your smaller builders are much, you know, especially when selling through retail, they're much more willing to take that risk. But the reality is they typically come to us. And the reason is is because when you fire it up, the phone numbers and everything that you see on there are ours. 
We want the consumer coming to us. Um, if it's clearly a hardware problem, we'll send them back to the distributor. But if it's software, we want to try to deal with it as best we can. Well, that's true. That's what they do. And in fact, we even have a program called RevShare. This, and this kind of goes to your, your comment, John, and we have a program called RevShare. If a builder signs up for our RevShare program, then anytime we sell a CNR license to somebody that, that bought a machine from them, we'll share some of the revenue back with them. Do you think any of them were that interested in it? You'd think they would be. I mean, hey, I sell 100 machines and I get some revenue back for people who sign up for Click and Rent. We're getting no uptake. The reason is because exactly what you said is they're only concerned with how can I drive the price down. In fact, what they'd say is, well, why don't you just give it to us cheaper uh, instead of giving us a rev share? Because they want that price as low as possible. I haven't understood fully, but that's what they want. They are competing in a very aggressive market, and anything they can do to lower the price, which is why the Fry's machine that has Linspire on it is a loss leader. They don't want people to buy it. They sold 50,000 of them. But they don't want them to buy it because they don't make any money on them. They want them to buy the more expensive machines with more software and more peripherals and everything like that. Does it all? <laughs> uh huh. And we actually have some builders that do higher end machines. We actually um, are working right now, and you'll see an announcement soon if you, if you haven't already, of a brand that we've helped co branding called uh, Kubox, K O O B O X. And basically, the idea is that, you know, we wanted to kind of create a vibe around a Linspire machine. And so you can buy different Koo boxes, different speeds, configurations, and so forth. Yes, with the exception of sound. Yeah, uh, we have one partner that we're working with that um, does this, and they've struggled because they need sound. But as you know, Linux and sound, network sound, is not 100%. Especially at the level that we go with, you know, all the, you know, uh, AV support, uh, audio, you know, video support, and so forth. It's it's challenging. Well, and I'm talking specifically networkable sound, yeah, no, okay? So, you know, if you're talking chipsets, we support a lot of chipsets. And what we struggle with on chipsets is basically two flavors, chipsets that have hardware mixers and ones that don't. Okay. And so, you know, we have solutions for both, and we try to auto-detect that where appropriate. But, but as far as when you're talking thin client, what people say, well, yeah, I don't want all the sound happening on the server. I want it to happen at the client. So that means you have to use uh, networkable sound system. And we typically don't do that real well, just being honest with you. But everything else we do work really well with, with thin clients. You, you, usually you have to replace our, uh, our we call LDM, our, our, our login screen with XDM or KDM or whatever else.
not necessarily a different version. We usually do some one-offs on the on the customizing of the tools. The infrastructure is already there, but um, you know, to provide a tool where their administrators can remotely lock down and um, secure the desktops, we have in the past been doing more one-offs. We are working on a, t a product that will be more encompassing, that is more generic. But what we found is usually when you go into an enterprise, they have unique needs, and so you end up have to customize it anyway. We, we do, but I, we haven't made an announcement yet. <laughs> yeah, but we actually do it differently. Uh, we actually do it at the motherboard manufacturer's level. So we go to ECS over in Taiwan and say, hey, why don't we do this? Uh, of course, it just comes down to cost. We have done that. Uh, some of the promotions we have done is we've done CDs in motherboard cases. We've done, um, we actually did a, a thing with Seagate where it came pre-installed on the Seagate hard drive. So you buy a Seagate hard drive and it had Linspire already on, you stick the drive in, you boot up, you're ready to go. So those are the kinds of things that we do from time to time. But it does get costly pretty quick. They don't ever want to pay for it, so, you know, it's one of those things that we have to fund. Because they're afraid of the support. They are afraid of it. Well, and, and it will change, but it's going to take some time, and it's going to take basically success stories to say, hey, we got to change. For example, we had... Best Buy contact us, the Geek Squad. You've maybe you've seen their commercials. and So they're starting to now become engaged with us more so that when people come in with a machine, because they, they service everything, not just what they sell. So when people come in with a machine, they want to be more intelligent of what Linux is or what Linspire is. So it will change, but, you know, I'll be honest with you, it's never the big guys that fall first. They're always the last to fall. And so this is why the micro centers are going to be the first thing to you know, 50-store chain versus, you know, a CompUSA, which has hundreds of stores. So <laughs> Dell will be the last to fall. We've had very d good discussions with Dell. Dell says, you know, we don't sell a machine that doesn't have Windows on it. When we point out, no, you sell one that has FreeDOS on it. Oh, yeah, well, we sell that one too, you know. But they don't want to admit it. They don't want to sell anything other than it has Windows because they don't want to support it. If you've seen FreeDOS, it doesn't do anything other than boot up to a prompt. There's nothing you can do, no software or anything. So they have no support costs. But they are very much afraid of making those big decisions. We've met with all the tier ones, HP, Dell, Gateway, eMachines, Gateway are now the same, but we've met with them regularly. They're always, oh, how's it going? Where are you guys at? And, you know, we're interested in what you're doing, but yet they're never willing to make that, that plunge because they just seem that it's going to be a big challenge for them. And, and rightly or wrongly so, they'll be the last to fall. Tough. Well, and I have to say that HP has been the only company that has selectively targeted markets to do Linux with. For example, right now we're doing a deal with HP over in Europe. Okay, Dell actually got really angry when a independent company from us was reselling Dells with Linux on it. it. Made them shut it down. So I mean, HP has at least said, "Hey, you know, where there's market, we're going to sell it." 
they're doing it over in Europe. They told us they're going to do a uh, they're going to do a trial here in the United States as uh, probably starting middle of next year. They're going to do another trial. So HP has been more forward thinking than a lot of them. But trust me, it's tough for you guys, as you say. You have big organizations. You want to make sure that you're not doing small volumes for the amount of resources it's going to take. Unless he uses Linspire. Unless he uses Linspire. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not natively, 32 bit. Yeah. And that's a big challenge, yes. And, and, and to be honest with you, 64 bit is way behind in Linux still, unfortunately. Yes. Right. That's and that's what I meant. Some of your proprietary drivers, which we depend on to to provide that, the Broadcom is a perfect example. No, but, but your point is exactly the, the struggle we have. This, the motherboards, take it at that level, the motherboards have an average shelf life of three to six months. Um, sometimes it's because they, um, they they don't have a clear understanding of how the GPO works. Do they? I, I'm, I'm not speaking specifically, but. Which is typically why we try to work at the builder before it goes to the CompUSA. The machine works out the door.
printers that works really well. I mean, I, I just bought a, a Samsung printer, color laser printer, brand new model, brought it home, had a Linux driver down on the box. That's an example. Yep, it did, actually. Oh. HP does a really good job of that. Epson does a pretty good job of that. Samsung does... Do, who, who is that? No, actually, Intel is one of the most, uh, one of the leading people in the whole open source world to get their hardware working. You know, all their Wi-Fi drivers, their open source modem drivers, so forth, video drivers. Yes, it's a chicken and the egg a little bit because you need a lot of users to get their, their minds to look at this, right? We do that. It's, if you go to L, if you go to lrazors.com, and it's a community of Linspire people that that basically get together with exactly what you're saying with a user group with a and they educate people on Linspire and then they submit their information and then we send them out a T-shirt and so forth. They get their picture placed on the web and then a little story what they did. So yes, we see that as a very big important aspect because we simply don't have the resources. Well, this is tough yeah. because shelf space is at a premium. And what they, yes, and that's what I was going to say. The market development funds, you know, oh, oh, yeah, we'll put your product on. How much are you willing to give us, you know? comments. Appreciate the time. Thank you.